Yeah, we do look forward to tonight's speaker. We do welcome our uh, dear friend in Coptic, an integral part of the organization. Alan Tut joins us tonight for another incredible presentation as we're doing some breaking free of the past tonight and uh, choose to believe. Uh, I remember meeting Alan for the first time, God, it's been a decade ago at least, and his wife Linda is the pianist on Sunday nights uh, for our Sunday evening experience at the center. And he uh, had a workshop that I attended and um, it was Choose to Believe. That's the title of one of his books. And it was uh, very inspirational, his passion for the topic, the, the book he wrote uh, exuded into helping us believe in ourselves and, and move forward with obstacles in our lives. And also the faith focus feeling that he's talked about, uh, I think it's part of harmonic prayer that he's touched on in the second book that he has available for you. And he's inspired us with uh, many wonderful talks that are available for replay too at the, the Coptic Center as uh, he expands his horizons and does a great job presenting frequently here on these Sunday nights and uh, for our, our seminars and workshops and so much more with the fellowship. So we look forward to his topic tonight. It's uh, Breaking Free of the Past, Keys to Making a Fresh Start is his topic and it's a good one tonight. Uh, for so um, actually Rose did cover some really great points that tie in very closely with what I had already planned for tonight. Uh, the one point that I really want to bring out first, one thing that I've found is that a lot of people who have gone through a lot of negative events, and this is generally the reason why people start thinking about breaking free of the past and making a fresh start, and the reason why. And then what Rose was talking about as far as trying to be positive, yet also trying to be true to yourself, trying, being honest with who you are and where you've come from. Uh, that is one of the reasons why a lot of us feel that making a change from the past into something new is a little bit more difficult because we want to carry along the past along with us. And it's not as easy to make a fresh start when you're carrying along the past along with you. So one of the first suggestions that I will be making here in this presentation is that depending on how much of your life you want to change, you may want to at least mentally set aside what has been and put that on a shelf for now and consider that, okay, I can always go back to that if I want to, but starting right now, right here, I'm starting a brand new life. There is nothing from the past that's coming along with me and that I am going to make this what I want it to be rather than what happened to happen in the past. And this here again is one of the reasons why many of us do get into situations where it seems like everything is going wrong, or there are so many things that are disappointing, or we are so frustrated with things not working out right, or we get into situations where it feels like we're banging our head against a wall and it just hurts. <laughs> um, and that's because a lot of us, and I will definitely be the first to admit that I have lived the majority of my life like this, I've taken the path of least resistance. I take the easy way out. When faced with a variety of choices, I take the one that seems the easiest at the time. And when we do this, when we pick our options from what is obviously available, we're kind of living life by accident. It just happens to be the, the direction that we go is the direction that's already in front of us. We don't necessarily go looking for what's the best pathway for me. Where's what pathway is going to take me someplace that I really want to be. And there have been quite a number of times I've kicked myself. I've criticized myself. I've really talked down to myself about, well, why didn't you be a little bit more intentional about how I lived my life. And that really is the thing that I have learned. That's one of the biggest lessons I've learned is that when we live our lives by intention rather than by accident, we can take more control over our life. We can have a, a more, 
what's I'm not sure what word I'm looking for here. Uh, we can we can have more of a say in how our lives turn out when we live by intention rather than by accident. And so, at some point, we come to a crossroads where we know that if we continue going in the direction that we have been going, our life is not going to be fulfilling. It's going to be more of the same. And depending on who you are, what type of life you've lived, what your preferences are, you may want to keep a lot of regular routine and tradition and keep things going in a similar direction just simply because that in itself is valuable. Or... If you're like me, who is a very strong Gemini, who loves variety, too much of the same gets to be boring. And if I'm doing the same things that I've been doing every day, every week, for years at a time, it's like, I've had enough. I don't care how enjoyable it is. Sometimes I just need a break. And so that's another idea to consider in this whole thing about making a break from the past and making a fresh start is who are you? Do you prefer things to be predictable and based on tradition and, and that type of thing? Is that who you are? Or are you the type of person like me who likes variety, who likes change, who likes to do something new and different every so often? Some people would go nuts if life changed every month or two. And so I'm not going to recommend that you make a change just simply to make a change because that may not be who you are. The first step in setting an intention and living intentionally is to decide for yourself, what type of life do you want to be living? Do you want to live a life of service? Do you want to be living a life of business? Do you want to be living a life where you are floating free without a care in the world? I mean, some people want different things. They want to be not tied down and go off in all sorts of different directions just based on the mood of the moment. So the first step, obviously, okay, I think I'm finally getting into where I really wanted to be for tonight. <laughs> There, there are a few steps to creating the life that you want to be living. And the first step is to figure out who are you as a person? Are you someone who likes to be on your own? Do you like to be in groups of people? Are you the type of person who would like to be on stage in front of an audience? What type of environments do you enjoy being in? So that's the first step. What type of environments are you most comfortable being within? And once you have that, then that kind of helps to set a direction for how you're going to design your life and to make choices on each individual aspect of your life and how you want to be living it. So once you know whether you like to work on your own, whether you like to work with people individually, in small groups, in big groups in front of an audience, that sets, us, that sets the first direction. The second direction is the type of service that you want to be for others. Hamid Bey talks a lot about being of service to others. In fact, Rose was just talking about the reason that we do things has a big impact on how successful we will be, whether we're positive, whether we're negative. If we're operating from a spiritual viewpoint, from a standpoint of helping humanity, then we are on a more positive line and we are more likely to be successful in our lives. And I can tell you from a strictly practical standpoint, I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible when you are organizing a business and the purpose of the business is to be financially prosperous, to be abundant on, on, in money. The thing that determines how successful the business is going to be is based on how much are you actually helping people. 
So the more you're helping people, the more successful the business is going to be. In fact, a lot of the material that I'm talking about tonight comes from a business class that I taught at the Coptic Center three years ago that eventually got turned into a course. It's on my website. There's, there's a series of questions, a worksheet that we go through for designing a business, which can also be used to design a life. Again, how do you like to be working is the first step. Do you like to work alone, one-on-one, -on -one, in small groups, in front of an audience? And then how do what seems to be the most valuable thing that you can do for the world? Do you think that it is more valuable to help a lot of people in a small way, or is it more valuable to help a few people in a big way? And one of the examples of this, if you have something to teach, like I have something to teach, Hamid Bey has something to teach, a lot of us have things that we have learned over time and we would like to share with other people. There's two major ways of doing this, and there's a lot of little ways in between, but on the two ends of the scale, I can write a book, get that published, and help thousands of people in a small way with that book. Or on the other side of it, I can be a mentor to somebody, be a teacher to one person at a time, and really tie into what that person is doing, what that person needs, and teaching that one person in a really big way. And so those are the two ends of the scale on, on the teaching aspect. What feels most natural to you? Does it feel more natural to try to help a lot of people in a little way or a few people in a big way? And obviously there's ways to kind of combine the two, but that's one of the other things to think about in terms of how you will approach life. How will you be of service to the world? And again, an, well, actually not again, one extra little piece where I said before that a business is most successful when it is helping a lot of people there's also this other thing, and most of us feel it. When we know that we have helped another person, it just feels good emotionally. We get, a lot, a lot of us, I won't speak for everyone, but a lot of us get this emotional charge knowing that we have helped another person. And so it feels good to be of service. And so that, that's kind of outside of the whole thing, but it's, it is important nonetheless. So... The next step in this process of determining how you will approach life and how will you be of service to life is to think about what are you good at. Some people are good at gardening. Some people are good at cooking. Some people are good at telling stories. Some people are good at listening. Some people are good at teaching. Some people are good at massage therapy. Some people are good at fixing things. Find something that you're good at because that will do at least two things for you. First of all, if you focus your life on doing something that you're good at, the odds are very good that the reason you're good at it is because you enjoy it. And so it's really, really helpful to design and set an intention to create a life that you will enjoy by focusing on something that you enjoy doing. So when you focus on that, it really helps you take things to another level. So find out what you're good at, decide what you're good at. And if you're not sure what you're good at, one of the easiest ways of determining this is to listen. Listen to what people compliment you on. I mean, Right now, I'm, I'm looking at the, the crowd of people here, and the first, the first example that comes to me is Diane. She's really good at telling stories. We love her stories. And so if she didn't already know that she was good at that, she does now. <laughs> um, Rose has a really good way of giving the Hamid Bey lessons. She puts a lot of personality in, into that. She's fun to listen to. And so that's something that I know a lot of people must must have complimented her on because I notice it every time she actually does a Hamid Bey lesson. So those are just two examples right now. Uh, 
the well let's let's kind of get out of that because there is more that i want to cover we have lots of opportunity for discussion afterwards we can go into all sorts of different things there so in terms of designing a life that you will enjoy there's also this aspect of how do you describe what it is that you do how do you think about the thing that you do and there are different ways of thinking about anything and one of the things that can make life more enjoyable is to think of your life as a movie if you are in a movie and the movie is about you shouldn't you be the star of that movie shouldn't you be the hero of your own story because I can tell you from my own personal experience, one of the reasons why I felt life was so dull and boring for so many years is because, quite honestly, I was not the hero of my own story. I was playing a bit part. I was just doing little things for little in little situations, and I never stuck my neck out to be something more than I was. And... I also saw things in a very dry, boring way. I wish I could remember more of the details, but several years ago when I was getting back into photography, I was watching this workshop on Creative Live. It's a website that produces tons of workshops on creative aspects, photography being one of them, a lot of other different things as well creativelive.com is the is the website I'm talking about. But there was a presentation being made by a photographer and the, his opening of the presentation, he told this story as this big epic event, something that you could definitely see as a Hollywood movie. And then when he was done telling it in the epic way, he told the exact same story the way most of us tell the story is that, well, he and this one girl kind of liked hanging out for a while. Everything seemed to be going good. She found someone else she liked better. She broke up with him, and that's the end of the story. But he told that story in a very over-the-top, very dramatic fashion. And I think one of the things that I have found that makes life far more interesting is when we see ourselves and what we're doing in that epic Hollywood movie format. And just as a quick example, one of the first examples that comes to mind is that if someone does, say, accounting and is helping a person fill out their tax forms, well, we could look at it on a very basic, very low-level fashion and say, okay, they're calculating some numbers, they're helping this person fill out the form, and they're going to send it into the government. Okay, that's one way of looking at it. But if we take this up a notch, up a couple of notches, and we look at this tax accountant as a hero of the story, and they are doing battle with the IRS, and they are going to fight to help this person save every dime that they can so they're not taken advantage of, that they're not being looted for everything that they have by the evil government, the, the empire, and there's this massive set of emotions going on behind finding those numbers and digging in deep to find the evidence to solve the mystery and then put everything together and organize it and, and present it in just the right way so that the battle is won. I mean, it's two different ways of looking at the same process. And so when we look at what we're doing and we can describe what we're doing as an epic movie and that we're not just helping someone, we are being the hero of the story. And if we can take it even further and say that we are a superhero, that we have this special power to accomplish something that no one else can accomplish, then it, ta it takes our life to, again, a whole new level. So that's just the basic idea there. So there are a lot of ways that we can follow through with this line of thinking. 
And the basic thing that I really want to get across is that a lot of times the way that we experience life is based on how we interpret the things that are happening. Do we interpret it as just one boring thing after another? Or do we interpret it as this epic story that could be the basis for a Hollywood blockbuster movie? And just by looking at our lives a little bit differently, we can inject some fun, inject some excitement into it that makes it feel so much different than it would have felt otherwise. So I think I've pretty much covered most of what I really want to get into. Uh, if I go too much further, then it opens up a whole new topic and then we'd be here for another 20 minutes. And I guess I'd rather not do that. So <laughs> we're going to kind of call it quits now. So I really want to get into a good discussion on this. I will do whatever I can to help you guys reinterpret the way that you want to take your life. And, and here's really the bottom line that I really want to base everything on is that if we just simply make our choices based off what's obviously available to us and just go, take the easy way out, go with the, the path of least resistance, we are living life by accident. And there's no telling where that's going to lead us. Sometimes that could lead us in a good, good place. There are times when I will go out into a forest, I'll go out into a park and I'll just simply follow my nose and okay, this pathway looks good. Let's walk through there. This pathway looks good. Let's walk through there. But I know that if I eventually get to a point where I don't know where I am and nothing looks good, I need to find a map and I need to figure out where do I want to be and then make choices based off of where I want to be and then set my intention for the destination that I desire. So while it can be fun to live life by accident, if you're not happy with the direction it's been going, it's time to live life by intention. And so that's what I'm going to encourage everyone to do, to set an intention for where you want your life to go and decide, what am I good at? What do I enjoy doing? What types of situations do I enjoy doing this in? Do I like working with one person at a time? Do I like doing things on my own? Do I want to be in a group of people? How can I serve people in a way that makes sense for me? And then if you need more direction, meditate, go within, touch into your higher self, and ask the question. And as long as you trust the process, as long as you relax and make contact with the divine, the answers will be there. So thank you and let the discussion begin. Thank you, Alan. I have to say something. I loved your presentation and um, it just comes to mind when you talked about the accountant, you know, it's like a modern job. Um, I have to say that every every year I meet my accountant and it's such a joy to meet him because for me, he's a hero. And I always, when I talk about him, I elaborate how, how wonderful he is, that he knows so much and he has that knowledge. So I think I would take that a little bit further. So not only um, we do in our own story, but we can, I think when we, when we, when we get that energy out and, and look at another person as a hero, you know, um, he's, it's always a joy when we meet, you know, because there's such a good energy because I think he senses that, that he's my hero, you know? <laughs> so, you know, so it's like when we meet people, it's like we look at their profession and say, oh, you're a hero, you know, you're a mus musician, oh, how wonderful. And I always, I always put them on a pedestal. You know, I have a, I have a friend who is in a Grand Rapids Symphony. It's, it's the greatest thing for me to, to be honored to know such a person, you know? So, and um, one other thing is that really ties in with the, uh, um, Years of went looking at the past. Um, I had a. I told my friend this week um, because we always like we like to look at ourselves. Oh, I had this bad experience. I had this happening to me. But I told my friend this week. You know what? Um, I had the the joy to experience all of this. 
um, I could have had a different life, you know, a more modern, more modern life and, and not so much turmoil and not so much um, going on. But at the same time, I got to experience things that um, others don't and at my age, you know, so it's the way you look at it. You know, you can look at, oh, I'm poor me. It's like, cool, you know, I have a really eventful life, even though it's up and down. So thank you. And, and thank you, because you, you brought out another example of what I was talking about, that we each have our strengths. We each have the thing that we're good at. And what you have just demonstrated is that you're good at seeing other people in the best possible light. And that in itself is a gift. And if you can communicate that to people, that in itself will serve them. So yes. that, that's a really great example of what I was talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Ellen, I think I'm so inspired by what you said. And I think for me, when I look back at world leadership training, this talk is ideal for uh, people have already decided they want to serve in some capacity or they've made a choice <clears throat> to do something different in their life. And Mike, Alan and John, um, this would be a, a wonderful. Uh, you and I are on the same page with that one. You yeah. and I are definitely on the same wavelength because I was thinking about having this type of information be included in the WSO class at some point yeah. to help people decide what is their pathway of service. You know, WSO is the first level of training in. I don't know how many of us here tonight were um, privileged to take all the classes. I took them all except minister training um, because I have my own ministry, which does not involve marrying, burying, or <laughs> doing that. But um, I so, so enjoyed the Coptic classes because um, there were wide encompassing your soul was fed, your body was fed, um, your mind. I don't know. I'm looking forward to uh, meeting as a group back at the center because I think that was very, very powerful. Yep. Yep. That will be a, a great day when that finally gets back to happening again. I know it. Yeah. So that's what I have to offer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, I, I was just thinking as you were speaking that um, starting a new life uh, or be breaking free from the past as more and more years go by. So now I'm in my late 70s and like I have so much past to break, break free from. <laughs> and it's kind of embarrassing when I think about it. So uh, how do we think about our past to be free of that? Well, uh there, there are a couple of different ways of looking at it. Uh, the, the way that I have started looking at my past for myself is that I look at it as my, my training process. That was my process of development. That was the time when I was gathering the, the information, the experience, and the knowledge that will eventually be beneficial when I do start stepping up and serving intentionally because I can call upon all of that past and use that in what I'm doing. And that's one of the things that make your story so great is because you have that ability to pull stories from your past, from your experiences that happened back when and bring yeah, it but, into yeah, the present moment. Yeah, but those are the good moment. times. There's bad times too, you know, I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, but, but the bad times are where we learn the most. I mean, I've, I've heard it said, that we learn more from our failures than we ever do from our successes. And if that if that's true, then I'm pretty much way up there in terms of what I know, because I failed so many times. <laughs> but Diane, you're the beauty who you are today. You're the sum of all your experiences. So, yeah. you know, the past is the past. And I think we're all at the age where we have done some introspection. And um, that's just because we're in our 70s. Mm -hmm. When you're 50, yeah. you're busy making your uh, 
future. Um, so you are who you are, you designed it, and um, you're beautiful the way you are. But now with tonight's talk, you can do more if you want. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing that I'll bring up just in terms of the age question, because I know a lot of people are thinking about that, that, okay, I've already lived my life. It's time for me to just relax and enjoy the, the last few years that I've got left or whatever. I mean, different people think about it in different ways. But the question is, okay, you're not done yet. If you were done, you'd be gone. And so you're, you're here for a reason. You're not done yet. There's something else for you to do. And whether you have a year left, whether you have 10 years left, whether you have 30 years left, there's a question of how do you want to be living the time that you do have left? Whether it's a year, whether it's a 10 year, whether it's whatever. And it doesn't require a massive reconstruction of everything in your life in order to make it more satisfying to you. And so it could be just a tiny little change, uh, three hours a week. I'm going to go out and I'm going to take this new attitude out for a test drive and see how it goes and see how I like it. And if I like it, then maybe I'll do it for five hours a week and maybe I'll decide to do it two days a week. And, and you just try different things and see what you enjoy and what tends to fulfill you and, and feed your soul. And then you just keep going with that. Thank you. Well, um, several things have come up for me. I don't know if I can remember all of them, but it seems like when we talk about failures, are they really failures? If they led us to a place that said intuitively, I've hit a brick wall. It's time to look in a different direction. This isn't the right direction for me. Is that a failure? No. It, you know, I think to, and sometimes to redefine that. Um, right. And instead of a failure, it's actually a success. It's it's teaching you mm -hmm. uh, like a barometer <laughs> where, you know, so it's actually a success. So that that was one thing that came up in talking about and speaking about that. Um, another thing is, I don't think we need to make it so hard. <laughs> um, it, it's. Um, I, that that kind of came up when Rose was reading about what Ahmed, Hamid Bey was saying. Is it, boy, all these rules, all this do, these do's and don'ts, and if you're not doing it this way, you're not doing it at all, and all of this stuff like that. And I, I, I can't. It for me, my personality, it's hard for me to go there. Um, and I remember when laughter yoga was was a big thing. Everybody was doing laughter yoga. Um, I did a piece on laughter yoga at unity when we were doing a, an all women's day and, um, somebody from that session asked me to teach at, at another, uh, uh the health benefits of laughter. And in the course of that, I found an article on smiling and it smiling in and of itself does the same things to your body that laughter does. The only thing that might be missing is that belly laugh that give, would strengthen your belly and, um, and, and the movement. But um, wow. I think that, and, and a lot of times they say serving other people can just be giving some, someone a warm smile. Mm -hmm. So if, and I had a teacher, um, a Qigong healing teacher, wow who teaches his, his students to put that little Buddha uh -huh. smile on their face whenever they're meditating. And it really makes a difference if you, if you mm -hmm. try it, because usually we go in and we're very somber and very serious. And, it, and if in the course of your meditation, you can just put that little Buddha smile on and be mm -hmm. mindful of what's happening when that happens and, and offer that smile to other people. What a service. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. it's just um i don't know when people are always looking so you know i i i want and, and it's not a good thing to say I'm smile glad. but um i you know i i took some nlp i worked with nlp a fair amount and and so when people are like that 
their body posture, your eyes, your facial expressions, that tells more about you than anything you could ever do or say. And, and so when I run into somebody who always looks like they're so serious or they're sad or they're angry or they're, whatever their facial expression is telling me, I just wonder what kind of pain is going on in that person's life. And, and, and a smile helps you reach out and connect with other people. So it doesn't have to be a great big thing. Right. Yep. Yep. It can be very simple. And the service, like you said, it could be just a smile. It can be a compliment. It can be just um, having the right energy so that th your energy, your aura radiates out into the space around you. And that blesses the people and the, and the situations that are around you. So that can be your service as well. And getting into how do you think about it? I mean, that could be the, the superpower of the superhero is that you have this, this amazing energy that simply fills the space that whatever space that you happen to be in. And it just changes the energy of everyone you encounter. And that could be the way that you think about your own uh, skill, your own strength, your own superpower, as, as we call it. Um, so yeah, I, I, I completely agree with everything that you're saying. It doesn't have to be complicated. Uh, we don't have to think of failure as a bad thing because it is a learning experience. And um, I, I kind of forgot some of the other things that you mentioned there, but um, yeah, it's, it's all good. One thing uh, that Alan, <laughs> if you're talking about a superhero, I want to tell a superhero story. <laughs> sure. Uh, some of you have heard it, but it's one of those things that I can start out by saying, you have to start believing that anything is possible. And I played golf with Hamid Bay several times. In this one place was, was a golf course he played in California. And uh, he wasn't a par golfer. He, he was kind of a duffer type of thing. And like you are now. Like I am now, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we reached about the 13th hole, and he was dubbing a shot all the time, and he knocked the ball in front of a stream. I said, uh-oh, he's going to knock it in the stream. Oh, man, I'm going to feel bad for him. And he hit the shot, and it went up to the stream, and there was a, a, a bridge there, and the ball hit the bridge and went across the stream. <laughs> And uh, Master Bay, how did how, how did you do that? That's phenomenal. That is that's a miracle. He never told me the reason why. So we played again, and he hit the shot. He and uh, he went over the bridge. Well, we went down. We found the same same bridge again, and uh, he hit another shot. And I thought, uh oh, that one definitely is going in. And there was a duck walking across the stream. <laughs> And the ball hit the duck. <laughs> it did not go in the stream. And I said, Master, what? come on, you've got to tell, why did you do that? How, that did, you do that? How did you do that? Oh, my gosh. He <laughs> refused to even look at me. And I said, well, we get to the 19th hole. We, you, you're going to tell me about it. And he never mentioned it again. I couldn't get anything out of him. Now, <laughs> why... Why did he show me that? Number one, he showed me because anything is possible. And Hamid Bey was a miracle worker. And he did miracles all the time. Par traveled with Paramahansa Yogananda. Traveled all over the country. And he, he was there in front of the podium, lying in, in a casket. And they closed the door of the casket and he was laying in there and he lowered his heartbeat to two or three beats a minute. Paramahansa Yogananda did the, did, did the talks and he traveled all over the country. Can you imagine the people that he impacted? Hundreds, thousands of people. Paramahansa Yogananda, he was vice president of uh, yoga at that particular time. So I'm sharing this because we have to start thinking big. And 
I, I think it's the power of prayer. Praying for the best for all people of all nations. That's what we're in a situation where we have to help people. We have to serve people. And we're in, a, and we're in the Aquarian age. And when the Aquarian age, the power of mind. So what do you want for humanity? I think that type of thing, we're going to fulfill our destiny and fulfill the Aquarian vision of humility, love, and service, and of the people, by the people, and for the people. So I just want to interject one thing. Um, I had a reading with Frank Graham on the ruins at one time, and he told me that my the blocks to my, I'm blocking myself. Um, to for from my gifts from expressing my gifts and it's in my it's a mental thing that I'm doing and so shortly after that I had an appointment with Virginia the woman I've worked with since the late 70s who sees energies and I was telling her about this and she agreed and and I said so how do I break free from these mental patterns that are blocking me from my gifts and she says tell your mind to let him go. I said, what? That easy? She said, yep, that easy. Tell your mind. <laughs> I, I guess I haven't told my mind <laughs> in the yeah, right I, way yet. <laughs> I, I would say that it could be that easy if you truly believed it would be that easy. But if you if if it's not working as quickly as you would like, then maybe you just have to look at it that it's a process. It's like any other habit. You're in a habit of thinking a particular way, and, and that's definitely where I have come from. I was in a habit of thinking along certain lines to see everything at the most basic level, and this whole idea of thinking about things at, in a more epic way, in a more uh, Hollywood story way, is a habit that I am still working on developing. So sometimes the way that we think, the way that we act, the way that we behave these are habits that take time to change. And it's just, again, being intentional. Let me do something a little bit different right now and move in the direction that I want to eventually get to. And here again, going back into this idea of change, change doesn't have to happen all at once. It, it's like if you're driving down the road and you just turn the, the wheel of the car just a little bit, Right, right, right at first, you're going to still be in the same lane that you were in. But if you continue going off in that slightly different direction, you're eventually going to run off the road because just a tiny little bit of a turn becomes more and more significant as time goes on. And so if we want to turn a corner, we're turning the wheels of the car a little bit and then a little bit more and then a little bit more and then a little bit more. And eventually we're turning turn the corner just by making a one small change after another. So changing our lives, again, doesn't have to be this big, complicated thing. It can be just one small change after another, <laughs> all leading in the direction that you really want to go. I found that with diet, you know, different diets that I tried. It's like, oh, I'm going to do this. And I go home and I get rid of all the stuff I'm not supposed to eat. And I buy all the news and then I get overwhelmed. And before I know it, I'm back in the same habits I was in before. And, and I do know that I have to take it a little bit at a time. And sometimes I get real down on myself. And then it's kind of like, okay, wait a minute. Where have you come from? What have you accomplished? And just remembering these little things that led me to this place because I was doing it different over here. And, and acknowledging myself for that helps a lot. And they're small things. Right. And that's how I have to make changes is in small ways. Right. And, and that echoes back to a point that I had mentioned in a slightly different context. And that is to, to decide or to figure out who you are as a person. What do you enjoy? How do you respond to things? Because some people like doing things one way. Other people like doing things a different way. And it's not just what you like, but also what's effective. So you got to figure out what works for you. And if you can make small changes at a time and eventually get to where you want to be, that's good. If you need to kind of make a serious break and say, okay, everything from the past is gone. I'm, I'm in a completely new 
pattern now. Go with what works for you. Don't just go one way or the other because that's what you were taught. Told, go with what works for you. And I think Diane had a question. Yeah, yeah. Comment. I just wanted to make a comment. Way back came to me when you were t calling me a good storyteller as a gift. The gift came as my perception that telling a good story uh, teaches people things on many levels that are very important. Mm -hmm. And so I developed the skill of being a good storyteller. I studied it very closely. It's not just by accident or by luck that I tell a good story. I study the order in which you give the information, the speed at which you say the chunks, the emphasis that you give to the certain portions. It all goes together to create an experience. And I did that out of my desire and my intention to give that blessing to people that's contained in the experiences of life. Yep. And, and the, the idea of knowing where your talents came from when you are in the process of starting a business or changing a business and you need information and material for the marketing of that business, going back to what the, the, the comic books used to call the origin story. How did the superhero get their superpowers? Uh, that origin story goes into the marketing of a business and it makes an interesting story to tell on a personal social level as well. Um, I went ahead and posted in the chat a link to a worksheet that I created with a lot of questions around what we were talking about tonight to help you just think about this idea of designing a new life by intention. And it goes through the questions about what type of situations do you like to work best? Do you like to work alone? Do you like to work in small groups, one-on-one -on -one in front of an audience? Uh, which do you prefer helping a few people in a big way or few, helping a lot of people in a small way? Uh, as far as helping to define what your um, superhero personality is, as far as if, if, you are the hero of the story, and if you were the, the main character in a book, how would the author describe your character? And you want to simplify that as much as you possibly can. Like for me, my, my character is the researcher. I'm the mad scientist. I'm the one who is pulling together all this information from so many different places, running one experiment after another, collecting all the data, and finally simplifying that data for other people. And that is my superpower. That is my gift. That is something that I do better than most. So there are questions on that worksheet to help you decide what are the key things that you are good at that you enjoy doing that can actually benefit and serve other people. And then it goes even further as far as what, what are your core values? What are the things that you stand for? What are things that you would fight against if you were the superhero? Uh, what type of people do you help? And things like, what is your weakness? Uh, we, we hear that Superman has the weakness of kryptonite and different heroes have their weakness where they are still human or they're still relatable because of those weaknesses. And again, that's, that's just part of the social nature of who we are, because if we truly want to help someone else, that other person has to be able to relate to us in some way. And so they can admire our strengths, but also recognize that we are still human because we do still have weaknesses and being honest about it. Um, all of that, all of that helps in a lot of different ways. So if you would like to carry on with this topic that we've been talking about, I encourage you to go check out the, the worksheet that I put together. Uh, there's an option to have the information from the worksheet emailed to you uh, if you want to do that. So um, check it out. And let me know what you think. Okay. Hey, Alan, I'll, I want to say one couple things. First off, in terms of positive people, 
John, John and Steve Davis and Jim Campbell, Jesse Campbell are very, very positive, changed my life. Also, meditation is very, very important. I came to meditation before I came to Coptic Fellowship, and uh, it made me get in touch with divine guidance, which is what you're talking about. And uh, Eve Hambe said, we're the living image of God. We're, we're living image of God. Think about that. The living image of God. We are. We are God. Think about that. That's that's mm -hmm. pretty incredible, man. So yep, I, it is. And John talked about uh, the theater of the mind. Remember, John? I remember that. Yeah, theater. I'm very impressed, impressed by that. Thank you so much, John, for that. And you too, Jim. Yes. You, you made me made my life so much more happier and positive. Thank you so much for that. And Rose, you're you're wonderful. You're a wonderful person, Rose. Thank you for everything. And Mike too, everybody, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to say the things that we think of, you're we talking before about failures are perhaps common situations that others can identify with. And if you're working with somebody and they're going through an experience, if you've had a similar experience, not the exact same thing, but something that might parallel um, what they're experiencing, you might be a better teacher than if you've never experienced it at all because you can identify with what they're going through and you can explain what you did at the time that you were experiencing that. And that might be a better lesson than if you've never felt that or never never had. I mean, if, if you've never had a failure, how can you work with somebody who, who feels like their whole life is a failure? Um, just, yeah. just a comment. Yeah. Yeah, that that's the reason why when when you really pay attention to how different products and things that are marketed, uh, someone who's selling a weight loss plan will talk about how they were so severely overweight and nothing else worked until they found this plan. And then that's how they they sell the plan or someone who is marketing a, a business idea how they tried starting one business after another and then nothing else worked until they tried this plan. And then that's part of the whole marketing of what they're doing is showing how they were in a similar situation to the people they want to help. So yes, your, your point is, is very, very valid there. At large, you were talking about trying to lose weight. Um, I, did a, a, a meditation diet kind of a thing. There was a man, and I can't remember even what his name was, but it was for a period of a certain number of days, 20 some days, might have been 22 days. Every day at the same time, it would be get on the computer and, and he would do this meditation talking about losing weight. And uh, tell, you're telling yourself each day that, you're able to be the perfect size and shape and whatever. And um, I don't know if that was why, but in the last year, I've lost quite a bit of weight. And I noticed on my doctor's report, my last doctor's visit was um, something about un unexplainable weight loss. <laughs> and I thought, I don't know if it's really unexplainable. I, I, I did this meditation that I was losing weight. <laughs> was it one of those 21 day meditation challenges? It might have been. It's been a while ago. It's been a year, about a year ago now that I that I did that. And somewhere I I have a paper and I wrote down some of the statements that I was to tell myself. And I don't know where that paper is now that I've moved, but I probably will find it one of these days. <laughs> I might have the, I probably have the man's name. You probably ate it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the first thing that's really, I mean, it, it's been an, an effortless kind of a, a thing. I, I've been losing weight without thinking about it. And, and it's like, I'm never, so I guess it is unexplainable in a way because I haven't consciously been telling myself that I'm dieting. 
But I, I have been dieting, but not because I've been focusing on it. It's been a subconscious action. So just letting you know that might be of help. Well, Alan, thank you. There's a lot of food for thought. I'm going to think a lot after this class. Yeah, the business class that this came from was basically a three-hour class. So, yes, there was a lot of information I was trying to pack in without trying to, well, I was doing my best not to overload anybody, but I still wanted to give as much as I could in the time available. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank Great you, Alan. Great job, Alan. It was fantastic. Yeah. Thanks, and Alan. Rose picked a really good topic to go with it. Thank yep. you. Yep. Yep. Very much. Work so. together well. Good yep. job, Rose. <laughs> good job, Rose. I've gotten so many compliments tonight. I'm, I mean, <laughs> I, you know, Rose, I think you should be our resident Coptic moment person. <laughs> no. I feel like to do that every week. <laughs> No, I do not think so. Oh, <laughs> I think everyone should have their opportunity and their chance. Yeah, but when you do something so well, it's got your name written all over it. Kind of like Mike, Mike in the MC position. That's he seems right. to be roped into it every single week. <laughs> You're wonderful, Mike. Well, we're glad that you were here tonight. Yeah, thank you. Um, Standing ovation, Mike. No, standing ovation to Rose and, and Alan, thank you. Gave us a lot to think about for sure.